Hi guys, welcome to Book Time. My name's Julia. Today I'm going to be doing the first part of my wrap up um, for the Readings Prize for New Australian Fiction shortlist. So I hauled the entire shortlist a couple of weeks ago on my channel. I'll put the link down below. And today I'm going to be talking about the first two books that I read from the shortlist. The first one of which was The Fireflies of Autumn and Other Tales of San Genese by Marino G. Vanoni. And the second one was Flames by Robbie Arnett. These are both five star reads for me. I adored them. They're very, very different books. The first one is The Fireflies of Autumn and Other Tales of San Genese by Marino G. Vanoni, who's an Australian writer. It was published this year by Black Ink. And this was just such a great book. Um, it sounds like it's a sh set of short stories because of the title. It's not a set of short stories. It's definitely a novel that you need to read from start to finish. That said, it the way that it's structured is a whole lot of short stories and vignettes about people in this town of San, <laughs> of San Genese, which is a town in Tuscany. So in that sense, it's comprised of a whole lot of stories, but I would more describe it as a story about stories or a story full of stories. So there's one narrator, like an unnamed sort of omniscient narrator, I guess, for most of the book changes a little bit towards the end and I'll talk about that in a sec and it basically just tells all these different stories and vignettes about the people in this peasant town and over several generations men women um, children adults the elderly people with disabilities um, people who migrate to America and return or Australia and return or Australia and stay there um, you know, all sorts of things. It's told in a very wry and witty writing style, but also a writing style that reminded me a bit of a fairy tale or a fable. Like, I don't think it ever used the words once upon a time, but it had the same sort of flavour. Let me just find an example. So this is the opening line. So there, there is a little prologue, but that aside, the opening lines of the first chapter. Listen to me and I will tell you a story about the days when there was poverty in San Genese and we used to go to America to work and make our fortune. I will try my best to tell it well with the skillful use of words and some feeling from my heart. So it is told in the first person sometimes, but as you can see, it's definitely got a self-consciousness about the way that stories are used to create ourselves, to think about our past, to shape our families, to imagine our futures. So. I feel like it's definitely one of the main themes or focuses of the book is sort of the magic and the power of storytelling and how much we actually need it in our lives. Now, this is not a memoir, but Marino Giovanoni has said in interviews that um, almost all the stories in this book were based on actual stories told to him by his father and tales that his grandfather told his own father and etc. etc. So they're real stories that took place in the town of San Genese, or at least they're variations upon, you know, exaggerated or embellished versions of those stories. So some of them are very funny, some of them are outrageous. Um, yeah, and it follows different family members. There are, there are so many characters, so it follows a whole lot of different family members and sort of the ways they intertwine. I mean, it's a small village, so everyone knows each other. It's very insular. And while I said it's funny and warm, it definitely doesn't shy away from the suffering of peasant life. So there's very much a sense of like the drudgery and the grind of working very hard, like physical backbreaking work that you need to do to survive and make enough money to support your family. Um, but even though what the book refers to as the misery of San Genese a lot, there's also a very clear sense that the author or narrator and many of the characters have a, such a strong bond and affection for this place like it's a place they can't let go of and that's where the element of sort of the migrant and migration story comes in so a lot of them go off to America and Australia you know early and mid 20th century to make money and return um, a lot of them end up staying overseas but constantly in this is like this total homesickness for family. So when they're away, they miss their families, they miss their hometown, but when they come back, they miss the new home they made. And um, there's sort of this really interesting focus on how the migrant, the idea of how the migrant never really has a home and never really reaches their destination, which I think is so interesting. I mean, I'm obviously not a migrant. I live in my home city and the times that I have lived overseas, I've lived in a few different countries. Um, I've moved you know, I'm a white woman, so I'm, I live a life of privilege anyway, in that sense. 
um, and I've never really had to struggle with like a language barrier or cultural barriers in the same way that they do um, when the Italians migrate to other places in the world. So um, that said, Marina Giovanoni wrote it in such a way that it was really compelling and I really, I, not that I could identify, but it really helped me understand, I suppose, that experience um, in a way that I maybe hadn't before. I would describe this as kind of a quiet novel, not in the sense that nothing happens because a lot of things happen, a lot of crazy things happen, outrageous things, as well as a lot of mundane things. Um, but somehow those mundane things are sort of imbued with a sense of meaningfulness and wonder. Like there's a constant sense that everyone's life is valuable no matter how small or how insignificant it might seem in the eyes of the rest of the world. You know, every human individual is important and has a story and contributes to the stories of other people. So there's always that sense. But um, lots of things happen, but it's quiet in the sense that uh, the writing style is quite restrained. So compared to Flames, which I'm about to talk about next, Flames has a much more brash, sort of bold use of language. And I don't, like, I loved both of the ways the writing was used. Like, this was written absolutely beautiful, but in a much more restrained, sort of quiet way that makes you think about the things I've been talking about, about people and stories and relationships. Um... And, but I, I definitely feel like it's sort of lodged in me. It's a book I would read again for sure because I feel like there was just so much in it. Um, not just the stories themselves, which were so rich, but the ideas around narrative and meaning and um, imagination as well. Maybe I'm over. <laughs> I feel like I'm really hyping it up. I, I really, really enjoyed it. I found it a very powerful book. I just felt this was a total love letter to this little town and all the generations that had gone before and everything they'd done and everything they'd worked for. And it wasn't big or bold or momentous necessarily, but it was for them and it was for this author because it made him who he is, even though he wasn't there for most of it because he moved to Australia when he was little. I really recommend it. I thought it was fabulous. The second book from the Readings Prize for New Australian Fiction that I read was Flames by Robbie Arnott. So I should mention again that the prize... To be eligible for the prize, it needs to be your first or your second piece of fiction. So this is Robbie Arnott's debut novel. This was amazing. I just finished it this morning, like an hour ago. I feel like I'm still on a total high. I cried. I got goosebumps. I tweeted the author straight away and was like, oh my gosh, this was an absolute triumph. Like it blew my mind. So I went into this expecting it to be a realist novel about dudes in Tasmania. I have no idea why I thought that. I had no reason to. That's just the assumption I made because it was set in Tassie and written by a man. So shame on me for making assumptions. I wouldn't say I judged the book by its cover because it has a beautiful cover which totally lives up to the inside of the book and the story. Um, so this does take place in Tasmania, which I always loved that part of what I expected about it because I love Tassie. Tassie is Australia's island state. It's our southernmost state. It has incredible landscapes. Um, it's quite got quite a low population compared to, um, well, I mean, all of Australia has a low population, but the cities in Tassie and the towns like have much smaller numbers than, like, say, Melbourne or something. Um, I love Tassie. My husband and I both have family there, so we, we go over there a lot and um, we've been all over the place. And may I just say, this guy, Mr Arnott, describes the landscape amazingly like incredibly I felt like I was there and not just because I know the landscape very well in Tassie he describes it so well like I feel like even if you don't know the landscape even if you're from a different country even if you're Australian you've never been to Tassie you will feel like you were there it is described so beautifully and so evocatively and it gave me goosebumps so many times I will definitely reread this like for that alone but in addition to that the story is crazy it is not realist at all. I would say it um, is about mythology, but he it's, it's, a, it's not about mythology. Like the story is kind of a mythology, I guess. And I'm not sure if these are based on actual um, things that people believe down in Taz or if they're things the author has made up himself or if they're based on some indigenous myths. I don't know. Um, but they were crazy. So there's like a river rat who is like the god of the river esque um, and he narrates a chapter there's a man who can turn into flames there is a wombat farm where all the wombats are mysteriously dying there is a family where the women um, like the maternal line of that family 
um, when they die, they're reincarnated as some form of local plant life. So like ferns or a paperbark tree or, um, or even like things from the ocean, like reincarnated as a body of shells and seaweed. Beautiful and amazing. And I would say the main character is actually a woman. I, I really don't want to talk about the actual plot because I feel like um, part of the joy is seeing this all unfold. But what I will say is so that all the things I just said are told in quite disparate chapters that seem very disjointed and it feels like there's a lot of characters and a lot of points of view and you're sort of like, okay, where is this going? But they do all come together in the end in very surprising ways and the pace... Um, you know, it be not page turnery in a bad way, but by the end, you really want to find out what happens. I just thought this was brilliant. Like, I don't know how he came up with the idea of these women being re reincarnated as ferns, um, or this man who can turn into fire, or this river rat god guy, um, and a cloud god, a <laughs> cormorant god who's very cruel and evil, and... Um, yeah, it was just really cool. I think it's a lot to do with grief. So the main character, Charlotte, well, she's not really the main character, but I, I sort of feel like it's her story. She and her brother, their mother has died and it's sort of the, the whole story hinges around how the two of them deal with their grief, basically. And I feel, you know, these extreme events involving all this mythological stuff can be read as kind of a metaphor for the intensity of grief. But it also is just a beautiful, crazy, crazy story. Like, I did not... I, nothing in this story I saw coming. I, I don't think it's perfect. Like, the one thing I would say, there was this one character who's sort of like um, a private detective and she's supposed to be sort of a hard-talking, hard-drinking detective. Um, so I feel like she was supposed to be stereotyped like that, but it almost felt a bit out of place just because the rest of the story and all the other characters and what happened to them and their personalities were so unique and distinct. So to have this sort of um, archetypal, or not archetypal, but stereotypical detective, it didn't feel like it quite fit in. I mean, it made sense in terms of the plot, but just in the overall scheme. Um, and I suppose the indigenous perspective on the landscape I mean, that's not really a problem with this book. I feel like it's a systemic problem, obviously, in the way that white people write books is how to incorporate the Indigenous perspective in a meaningful way, particularly when about the landscape. Um, so, yeah, that's an ongoing problem that I'm always thinking about when I read books that, are, that particularly focus on the landscape written by white people. But, I mean, this did incorporate some of the Indigenous perspective towards the end, and I would definitely say there was awareness, a, a very clear and stark awareness of how the white invasion and colonisation of Australia, and in particularly Taz, where it was particularly brutal. I mean, it was brutal everywhere, but Tassie has a very brutal and bloody history of colonisation. Um, that was definitely taken into account. Yeah, obviously it's not perfect. It made me think about it, but I feel like it's definitely aware of those issues and those conflicts, um, even though you know, one book can't resolve them all, obviously. I, yeah, I loved it. One of my top books of the year and maybe one of my top books ever. If you're someone who's gen generally only into realist narratives, I probably wouldn't recommend this one. But if you like things that are strange and weird and go where you don't expect them, this was, this was really great and very beautifully written and I highly recommend it. So for the rest of my readings wrap-ups, I think I'm going to do the same thing. Like I'll read another two, do a wrap-up and read the final two and do a wrap-up and maybe you know, try and think of a prediction of who might win. And hopefully I'll do those over the next couple of weeks. And if the rest of the books are anywhere as good as these two, I am in for a real treat. And so is anyone else who's bought the books and wants to read them. Um, if you've read either of these books, if you've read either of these books, please let me know. Um, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts. I know there's a few other booktubers who have been doing reviews of the Readings Prize for New Australian Fiction shortlist as well. Um, and I've been loving watching them. I'll link a few of them down below. And thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.